So we are coming now to our final talk of the day. Um, it's been a long day, but thank you for staying here. It's been some fantastic talks. It is Open Future and Open Talent, NASA Innovation. We have Steve is on the, on the agenda. Steve, come on up and tell us all about NASA. Thank you. Ah, last talk of the day. You made it. You went all the way through blockchain for me. I'm uh, totally in your debt. Um, well, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing at NASA with open innovation. I know we keep referring to open innovation uh, in various uh, talks today, and it's somewhat of a mystery to some folks, so I wanted to, to unpack that a little bit. Um, I work at our NASA Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation, which works really across the whole agency and across the entire federal government to help organizations understand what this is and how to use it and then facilitate its use. But I want to talk a little bit about why, because I think that drives the need to actually use this. And that is something that everyone in this room knows, which is the world has changed. It hasn't changed just a little bit. It's changed a lot. And what I have to tell our workforce over and over is it's changed so much that a lot of the methods that we have used for decades are starting to break. Um, it kind of all starts with this. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you guys track population, but the world population has doubled in my lifetime, more than doubled. It took 1,400 years from the start of the Common Era for the first doubling. 1,400 years. But we're at a part of the curve where it's doubled, more than doubled in just our lifetime. What does that mean and why am I talking about it? Well, it just so happens that that, that comes along the same time that there's a lot of wealth around the world and it's building and it is now resulting in more people being educated and more higher education. In fact, over the last 20 years, the number of people that have gone through secondary education has multiplied by two and a half. And we're starting to see the results of that. In the earlier session this morning, if you're here, you heard me say that today, 90% of all scientists that have ever lived on planet Earth are alive today. That's huge, right? And you can see it in the number of patent applications, and you can see it in the number of PhDs, and if you go look at the amount of funding that goes into research, it's all on this, this curve that's going up and up and up. And a lot of this is resulting in what I call um, technology building blocks that are kind of accelerating this rate of change on top of that change already. These are things like blockchain and CRISPR and open APIs and machine learning and robotics and automation. These are all interesting technologies because one, they're very inexpensive to get access to. You can go buy a metal 3D printer that is capable of high quality parts for $10,000. That's huge. You can go learn about CRISPR and get a CRISPR kit for $200. That should scare everyone that you could edit genes for $200. Somebody said they took their kid to the children's museum over here that they're dead, and they actually help you learn as an eight-year-old how to extract DNA. The amount of complexity and knowledge and, and things people are able to do has just multiplied. And so now those tools are being used across not one industry, but every industry. And that's really where it gets to be interesting because if we were to plot across all industries, you know, your industry is kind of that dotted line in the middle, that little narrow set, and getting more complex as we go up, up, then you can kind of look at something like machine learning and it would look something like this, very simplified, right? Is you probably have some machine learning initiatives going on at your, your industry. Some have progressed up, others are just starting. But Machine learning is something everyone is dealing with, just like all of those technologies. And so the, the leader over here, it's probably somebody like John Deere. I don't know if you know this, but John Deere is one of the world's leaders in machine learning and artificial intelligence. They have entire factories in the field. But if you went to their meeting about their machine learning and listened to the pitch about their new technology, you wouldn't understand their problem, you wouldn't understand the jargon they're using, and you would walk away from that meeting thinking, that's great for John Deere, didn't help me at all. But the reality is that a lot of those technologies, if you understood their problem and understood them, you could connect to your problem. And at no other time in history have we had so many 
latent solutions out developing in other industries that have potential in our industry. And so we have this pro, right? So many solutions. Again, 90% of all scientists live in, alive today. There's a lot of work going on out there. The con is that you can't find it. If you think you can Google the latest and greatest technologies, you don't understand how big this technology explosion is, and you don't understand how difficult it is to find technologies that are being developed in another domain. So that's the problem. The thing about this is it's just getting faster. The rate of change for the knowledge and the technology is increasing, so it's harder to find the skilled folks that even understand this stuff, and it's harder to keep up with the tech advances. So the threat for organizations is if we want to remain competitive and relevant, then we have to innovate. We, it's not optional anymore. We used to be able to do it every few years. Now we actually have to bake it into everything we do. This is my panic slide. Can you tell me this is just makes you panic? Just looking, or have a seizure. Um, in the, this is actually an older chart, but I, I still use it because it demonstrates something I think that's interesting, which was over a 15-year period, recent 15-year period, over half of the most successful companies went extinct. And it, it actually shows up a little bit better in this trend, if I can get it to go, which is the average lifespan of our most successful companies. Not all companies, our most successful ones has gone from 90 years in 1935 down to 18 in 2018, I think it's about 14 now. The average lifespan, disruption is real. It is coming and it is coming for everyone. I'd like to show a little bit about what's going on here with an example out of Sub-C7. I think some of you know them out of the oil and gas world. They do a lot of oil and gas support. And one of the things they do is they take, um, they actually do pipeline bundle inspections for undersea pipelines. So they take a ship out at a million dollars a day, they drop a van-sized piece of equipment next to that, that pipeline bundle, and then they take about two weeks to inspect that pipeline. And so they went, and they were seeking a way to improve this, and they went to Nine Sigma with that challenge, and what they found was after two weeks, they found a technology already in use already matured and in use in the mining industry that was handheld and could do that same job in two hours. So that's a huge improvement, right? And that, it, I mean, 100x faster, lots of time in, in money savings, but what their big takeaway was, oh my gosh, if we had not found this before our competitor, we would no longer be in this business. This disruption where things mature in one, one domain and then pop over to another domain is happening more and more. So this is how we staff companies, right? We hire people. We, we typically have a lower limit to what, what those skills need to be, and we hire and we typically can't afford the people at the very top, uh, but they all have domain expertise in our industry. The thing is, is if all of these... Uh, if all of these innovations, these ideas, these concepts, these technologies are out there and are latent in the system, if I put an individual on my innovation team and say, go innovate, then they can access some things, but very few, right? Because they, they only have the jargon and the, the, the view of a few. If I put a team on it, I'm always going to do better, right? Because teams always do better at this stuff, but they're still very limited. And it turns out, if you use the crowd, the crowd acts as a giant dragnet across all industries. And it's, it takes a minute to wrap your head around it, but statistically, large crowds can actually do this kind of function and do it in a way that nothing else will work. There's not machine learning, there's not individuals. It is amazing. So it's this kind of right tool that came along, along at the right time. So that's what we're talking about, open innovation. Open simply means going outside of your team. Now that could be going outside your team to just within your organization, or it could mean going to a worldwide community. But to do that, to actually find solutions and to try to find uh, technologies and answers for your problems. 
Now you can kind of think of these as, as based on crowd platforms like you've seen before, where there's low friction matching at scale, like Uber and an Airbnb, right? Those are, I've got a bunch of drivers who can drive and I've got a bunch of people who need rides and I'm gonna use machine learning and connections to both of those to match them up and get something quickly to, to find that ride for that person. Or same with, the per, with a, a, a place to stay, right? I've got a place to stay, I can match that with somebody who needs a place to stay. Here's a, a little tidbit on that too. Remember when this first came out? What was the first thing that went through your mind? There's no way I'm getting in a stranger's car, that's crazy. There's no way I'm gonna sleep on somebody else's sheets, that's gross. And yet both of these companies establish trust. I'm gonna come back to that later, just kind of tuck that away. So these new platforms that you may not have seen are open innovation platforms. And they basically are web platforms like you've seen, but they actually are two-sided networks where on the one side, they recruit members. And they recruit members out of a passion, right? These folks like to do things. So top coders, 1.6 million software developers and data scientists all on one platform who joined because that's what they love to do. So they're already not the lower tier of those folks, by the way, because if you're willing to actually, in your spare time, sign up for one of these platforms, that means you're passionate about it, right? And the reason they're doing it is to connect with other people who have that same passion, to learn new skills, and to demonstrate those and maybe connect with work. Uh, Tongle, 100,000 filmmakers. Grabcad, 11 million mechanical engineers and designers on one platform. Freelancer, 63 million people on that one platform. Think about that for a second. That's getting cl very close to 1% of the entire world's population in one community, if you do the math. HeroX and Agorize, these are actually not domain specific, but they're actually filled with people who love to problem solve. You've met these people. They're kind of nerdy, not fun at cocktail parties. They remember all the math from, from college. You know them, right? They love those crossword puzzles, all that kind of stuff. They love these kind of crowds. Uh, there's one called Innocentive that's now Wazoku that, that it had about 400,000, 75% had masters or PhD in one community. I'll talk examples of that in a minute. Um, so the other side, whoops, the other side of that, by the way, I said it was a two-sided network, is the customer side. Well, it turns out that, that these crowds of passionate people can provide value. And in fact, they do, and they do it for companies or organizations like NASA. And in fact, they're doing that a lot. Why don't you hear about that? Because it works really, really well, and it is their competitive advantage. But IBM and Facebook and Draper Labs, they're all using these mechanisms to get their hard problem solved. And I'll give examples of those in a second. So the theory goes something like this. Um, if, if expertise is what you need, right? You always think you have the smartest people. You don't. But if you were to look at that domain expertise, it looks something like this, right? The peak of this is people coming out of high school, and then you've got university students, and then you've got way out to the right the, the world's experts. And if you're like NASA, and I hope you all are, you hire well. You don't even start hiring until halfway through that curve, right? And you've got lots of those smart people, and you've got some of the world's experts. Here's the thing. I tell our folks, yes, but you're actually this really tiny blip. Same, same location, you still only hire those people, but all of NASA with all of its subcontractors is only 60,000 people. That's everyone working space, and so the value proposition is accessing this long green wedge here, right? If, in fact, smart people is what you need. And it turns out these curated communities have, not all of them, but they do have these people. Um, there's also another curve that came out of Harvard uh, that shows this kind of traditional and non-traditional participants in this challenge. And what they found was the value of the ideas looked something like this, which is kind of what you would expect, right? Most of the valuable ideas are going to come from your traditional experts. And your non-traditional are not going to provide that much value, except at the very high end, because statistically, there are actually more great ideas coming from non-traditional folks. And in fact, we see that in the stats. There's a study they did on in a set of uh, challenges where they, they had solved a bunch of really hard problems for industry. And they looked at all of those problems. It was, again, an MIT study. 
And when they looked across all of those successful challenges, they found that 70% of the time, the successful solution came from someone outside of the domain of the problem owner. So think about that for a second. How do we do R&D for decades and decades? We put six chemists in a chemistry lab and say, go innovate. And this says that the technology explosion that we have today means that model doesn't work, except for maybe 30% of the time. And 75% of the time, the solvers already knew the solution. In other words, it existed in some other industry, you just didn't know about it. And we see this all the time. But let's just say you want to use crowds, right? How do you do it? Well, it turns out prize challenges act as a magical uh, algorithm, if you will, to actually accessing these. Now, there's a big noise, signal to noise ratio with crowds. There's a lot of crap that you get from them. But you, if you get the right kind of contest and the right kind of platform that knows what they're doing, they can filter that out, they get the right incentives, they get the right structure, and they can actually get really nice results. It's about how you formulate the problem, how you design it, how many prizes there should be, how much should that prize amount be, uh, should there be extras uh, and events, uh, how do they execute that, what are the legal terms, have they worked that with lawyers, what's the intellectual property stance, how do they, how do they protect your competitiveness, all of these things is what these companies do for a living. So, let me just give you some examples so you can give a, get a feel here. This is one I really like to use because it shows a couple of things. There was a large food manufacturer that needed a better way to get grease off of its potato chips. Uh, the way it was doing that was it was mechanically vibrating the chips as they came out of the grease. And that would shake off the grease, but it would also break up a bunch of the chips as well, right? Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, and most food production engineers are mechanical. We are the world's experts on vibration, and you can see that, right, with this solution. Um, the first thing that Innocent of the company that was working this, this platform that was working this did, is they reworded this problem to be not how do you remove grease from potato chips, but how do you remove a viscous fluid from a delicate wafer, okay? This did two things. One, it protected that potato chip company from all of its competitors knowing that they were trying to work on this problem, which is an important thing, right? More importantly, it abstracted the problem such that it was more attractive to people outside of the food production industry, right? Because if you're a physicist and you see how do you get grease off of potato chips, you're like, I'm not a food producer. I, I don't know about potato chips. But everyone understands a viscous fluid and a delicate wafer, right? And in fact, the solution that came back on this as the winner was to acoustically vibrate the, cookie, the air around the cooking oil to get it to a resonant frequency that it would just kind of fly off the chips. And what's really interesting, there's two interesting things about that. One, that's a vibration solution. The mechanical engineers were blind to for, I don't know, 50 years? How long have they been trying to get grease off of potato chips? A very long time, right? But it was a violinist who came up with this and submitted this, who had seen the rosin dance around on her stand when she hit certain frequencies, thought well, that that would work for these chips. And sure enough, Roche Diagnostics, another case study out of London Business School. This is a large multi-billion dollar pharma company in Europe. Um, they were trying out an incentive in this new open innovation work, and they brought about 10 of their unsolved problems. And this particular problem, this is just a kind of a dummy diagram, but they brought an in vitro uh, diagnostic machine that they had been working to bring to market for 15 years. And what they couldn't get to work was the, the very precise inlet sample uh, quantity and quality. So 15 years, they brought lots of folks in to try to bring it to market, couldn't make any progress on it. They then posted that on Innocentive, a crowd of about 150,000 at that point. And within six weeks, they not only had solved it, but two independent solvers had brought the same solution to them because again, it already existed in another industry. But what really blew them away was when they looked at everything that had been submitted that didn't win, it was everything that their proprietary research had tried over 15 years, in 60 days, by a crowd that was not specialized in biotech. The crowd statistically can do things that you can't even imagine. 
Um, where crowdsourcing really shines is in data science, something that everyone should be engaged in. Um, part of this is just the nature of, of how crowds work and the, the passion of the, the data science crowds. Uh, Harvard was looking at this because they were trying to figure out, is, are we just finding the best data scientist, you know, like we were talking about earlier, or is there something else going on? So they did a, an experiment where they got with the National Institutes of Health. They got this Megablast algorithm that, that they work with. Um, and this is one that they used as a workhorse. It ran just a little over four hours per machine, got an answer that was like 72% accurate. Uh, and it took them a couple of years uh, of development and a couple million dollars. And they, they put two postdocs on that who were specialized in that, that domain and top-notch data scientists. And they gave them $120,000 uh, for a year and said, go. At the end of that year, they had an order of magnitude improved performance. They, they got that down to 47 minutes and increased the accuracy at the same time. A really great solution, right? Now, instead of a couple of runs per day per machine, you can do about 10. That's a big deal. They then ran a top coder challenge with a $6,000 prize over two weeks, and they got it down to 16 seconds and increased the, the answer to 80%. Now, here's what I like to point out I don't think I have a laser on this. The big red dot's the winner. There's a logarithmic scale going right to left, getting faster and getting more accurate as you go up. The big red dot's the winner. The green dot is, is the, the baseline. Blue dot's the postdocs, right? Those 25 red dots to the right of the big red dot, those are all the losers who also had solutions that were one to two orders of magnitude better than the original. There's something that happens in the crowd with open innovation that's really amazing. And by the way, there were 89 different approaches in this one contest, which meant there's even more improvement that you'd get from those identified approaches. Okay, I'm gonna pause just a second. Um, th this is a little bit about our organization. We run the NASA Tournament Lab. That is our public brand. Um, and that really is where we post challenges from across NASA and across other federal agencies that want help with us. Um, our real tool is to facilitate the education of what open innovation is, kind of like I'm doing today, along with providing the contracts and the mechanisms for those groups around NASA and around the federal government to be able to use this. Because let's face it, if you ever want to go contract, that's, that's a year right there in the federal government. Nine months to a year. So we, put, we basically looked at all those barriers of entry and tried to get as many of them out of the way. A lot of work with legal, a lot of work with procurement, a lot of work with just trying to understand how things work around the organization. And so now we can provide that um, through a series of, of contracts that we have. One is a multi-vendor IDIQ, which has 32 different crowds uh, in addition to some other communities. We have now access to over 50 crowds that represent 200 million people worldwide and have a whole range of capabilities all the way from simple graphics up to really complicated hardware all the way to freelance experts. Um, we can actually do all sorts of different kinds of challenges. We've done close to 700 projects to date. 94% of those are actually successful, so very low uh, failure rate. Uh, and when we ask our users, how much would this have cost to do if you had tried to pursue this solution just using your traditional methods? 75% of the time, they tell us it was cheaper to do what we did. And in fact, the average cost savings is close to 50%. So it's not, it's not trivial. Um, so a few examples, and then I'll get out of your hair. Um, Data-driven forecasting for solar flares. This is where we have astronauts that go for spacewalks and we needed a better way to, to forecast when a solar flare is gonna happen so that they had time to get inside to protection, right? So we had a two-hour forecast capability. We were trying to double that. We put a challenge together out with Incentive. Incentive's results was eight hours, twice what we had even targeted. And the guy who came up with this was actually a retired cell phone engineer who had an undergrad in heliophysics he had never used, and he figured out how to use the math that's used to extract signal from noise and apply that to heliophysics to get an even better answer. So it was an entire new approach for how we do uh, solar 
uh, flare forecasting. Space poop challenge, I just gotta say, when you're doing space stuff, there's a whole bunch of human um, stuff you gotta deal with. This is one. So the Orion spacecraft that is actually coming back from the moon as we speak will have crew members the next time it flies. Um, and when they fly, they pressurize the capsule, they launch, and then they do one burn to get out of the low Earth orbit and headed towards the moon. And when you do that burn, once that burn is complete, if you have a leak in your pressure shell, you have to get back into your orange launch and entry suits and live for four to six days. Space poop challenge, you can kind of get an idea of what that is. If you've ever had a baby and seen baby rash, you know, diaper rash, you know what I'm talking about, except over four or five days, that actually could be lethal. It could be really dangerous stuff. So we had a challenge around that. We had 5,000 submissions for this but we actually had a clause in the, in the contract that said Hero X had to filter that down to just the ones that met our requirements. We only saw the top 89, right? And the winner of that ended up being a, a, a flight surgeon who said, you know, in laparoscopic surgery, we pressurize the belly to about 15 PSI, which is about the same delta pressure we have in the suit. And we actually insert, we have this little design of an insertable airlock that allows you to pass wipes and different things through. Could you use something like that? Is, Really creative stuff. There were several other really creative designs. Um, again, getting you uh, things from other industries uh, as so possible solutions. Uh, a couple of examples here was when we were trying to do inflatable uh, habitation modules, which I think there's one on the space station right now. Um, we had to figure out how to measure strain in new materials. And this group was just hung up on that, which is not a major issue, but it was holding up the whole project. And they were able to do a quick challenge on an incentive and were able to find three different technologies. And what they said was, this was so simple and elegant, how could we have not thought of this ourselves? Which I think is the tagline for what is innovation, right? Um, and again, I don't know if you're seeing some of the costs on these, but $40,000 to, to get a, a project unstuck is not a lot of money. At Robonaut, we've done a bunch of vision algorithms. Uh, I have a whole portfolio of these. We could do this all day. Um, we were doing this, we've done this for about 11 years now, and when we were about f five or six years in, we noticed that the crowds that we were using for these contests, some of them were also doing freelance work. And in fact, Top Coder had this kind of blended model, freelancer was doing contests, but then they were really freelancers. And we started reading up on what these platforms were because they were the same crowds, or there were similar crowds, and we were thinking, well, What's the difference? What's happening here? And what we found was really surprising to us. We found that there's a new way people are assembling on these communities, and they're starting to work this way. Um, it's not just about contests, but it's about labor, uh, and, and that this big shift has been going on. This used to be a big surprise to people, then COVID happened, and now it's not such a big surprise. But in 2017, we found a study that said, hey, look, people are moving into the freelance gig economy at three times the rate of normal employment. And by 2019, over 40% of the average organization's total workforce was comprised of non-full-time employees. That's pretty huge. And on that same study from Edelman Intelligence, it showed that by 2027, there would be more freelance workers than full-time workers. And I don't care if your organization doesn't use anything but full-time workers, this still isn't gonna affect you, right? But then COVID happened. And that was a 4% increase and 4% decrease that you saw in the last chart. Between 2020 20 and 2021, it was a 34% increase because of the pandemic. People just left in droves. And this is affecting how we can access the skills we need to get things done. And so we have been now looking at these open talent platforms, which are basically this, this new gig economy because none of our organizations are geared to use them, right? We're geared for full-time recruit and retain talent. And that model is not able to keep up with the rapid changes. And so we're having to actually start to work. I actually talk more to HR people now than I do to engineers, which is kind of weird. This new workforce is both on-demand and persistent. In other words, I can get a one-off or I can go back to that same person over and over and build a relationship, right? 
They're available globally and locally. Think about the fact that Uber has over 5 million drivers globally, but one shows up at your door. Grunt workers, we, that's how a lot of us think about, you know, oh yeah, the gig economy is, is Uber drivers. I've been able to actually access previous CEOs and previous presidential fellows and really high-end ta talent this way. And in fact, that's more likely the way you're gonna be able to find them than actually being able to hire them. Here's the real trick. We now live in a world where lifelong learning is absolutely necessary if we hope our workforce is going to keep up with all these changes we're talking about. But your, how much are you paying for training inside your organizations? The average is $1,000 per employee per year. That's not gonna keep up with any. I, I have a whole set of slides that show the World Economic Forum study that says that's not even gonna touch it. These folks, they're all doing the lifelong learning. The studies show that freelancers are upskilling much, much faster than people that are full-time employees. And that actually doesn't matter to you. What matters to you is that you get the person that you need <laughs> to do your task, right? And then these, these platforms are providing lower and lower friction access. In other words, they're finding ways to shortcut the provisioning. There's uh, companies like, uh, Vec uh, I'm gonna forget their name, uh, but they are basically working on ways to get uh, really streamlined uh, background checks so that you, it's done once, everyone trusts it, it's on the blockchain, and you can get someone literally that day that you can trust uh, that can actually work on your project. Okay, this is my last get off the stage chart. I know I'm standing between you and alcohol, so I will hurry. Uh, open is the future. If you haven't gotten that from today, I hope you get that from today. And innovation is no longer optional. Um, these crowds, these gig workers, these freelancers, they are a rapidly growing resource that is getting more and more capable. Um, these curated communities are attracting passion and activating that passion, something that we all try to do in our organizations, uh, but is really difficult to do. Um, and the, they're really, this, is, this method is the most effective way to actually provide that dragnet across disciplines. And my last one is, anyone who fails to, to innovate and fails to kind of capture this, it's, it's kind of game over soon, right? The, the old ways really are breaking. So with that, I will get off the stage and let you guys go drink, but I, I will stick up, stay up here for Q&A for as long as uh, anyone yeah, we wants have, to. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Two? Right. Okay, because I went over and I knew I would, but anyway, go ahead. Hi there, my name is Andrew. I was wondering, uh, what, would you, what would you recommend as, I'm right here. Oh. <laughs> what would you re recommend as a good resource for uh, creating a problem statement? Because I, I just imagine that's a really slippery slope between providing enough technical granularity uh, sure. without anchoring the, the, the participants and you know, the, yeah. the problem. If, if you want to make your own challenge and do that, it's to get it as narrow as possible and then provide a lot of resources on the back end. I would say my advice is, don't try to go alone. These platforms are much better resources for that. We only get the problems and then we hand those off. We don't try to actually formulate the problem statement. We let the vendor do that because they know their crowd, they know how, what incentivizes them, they know how they've been trained, and we rely on them to provide that. Um, now that said, we do study, because we have an internal crowd as well at NASA, and we do study how to actually do that. And it, it's, it's about getting as much of the jargon out getting the, the problem really as crisply uh, stated as possible um, and as both at, as high level a statement as you can for as narrow a problem as you can. So a great question. Uh, Steve, uh, thank you. Best presentation of the day for me, so thank you. I love that. Uh, we met earlier. I'm Mark Hannigan, so I'm co-founder of a uh, uh, energy freelance talent marketplace for the energy transition. So I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I get it. I agree with you. But how do we reconcile that with every company I've ever worked in? The mantra is protect your IP, yeah. conceal from the competitor. Sure. At the employee level, it's 
knowledge is power, don't tell anybody and then I won't get laid off. Middle yep. managers don't like their teams speaking with other departments. Yeah. You know, how, how does that play out? Such a great question. And I will say a question I get every single time. I should probably put a chart in, but honestly, it's better to have the dialogue. Um, I think it's, it's a hard question um, and, not, and not one with an easy answer. I think there's a couple of things. One, tech is changing so fast that I'm finding more and more organizations I work with are not putting as much emphasis on capturing the IP and protecting the IP. It's, it's much more defense IP than it is kind of protecting everything because they end up spending a ton of time and money and resources to get and protect that IP and then it's obsolete in such a short period of time. Now, there is some IP that that is not the case and you should be protecting it. Um, when it comes to open innovation pieces, realize companies that do this, they deal with companies that have that issue all the time. And so they're really good at obscuring the problem, at making the problem statement something that somebody's not gonna tell what you are. I'll give you an example. Um, Top Coder hosted a challenge uh, that was to take social media downloads that were publicly available and mine those uh, for pictures of buffalo. And the resulting algorithm needed to track individual buffalo in Yellowstone National Park over time. So thousands of individual buffaloes know exactly where they are over time. Popcoder actually successfully built that algorithm. It actually exists, and so you can track all of the buffalo. Turns out, though, the client, which was unnamed, was the CIA. And they were really building an algorithm to track Russians in Crimea. So, you know, you can tell me you've got a sensitive problem that you don't want to put out in open innovation, and I will tell you that story, because it is possible to, to abstract and change the problem uh, or obscure it. And there are ways to get crowds to actually do NDA. So uh, Topcoder built Comcast's Xfinity software or pieces of it. So that was enterprise level, multi-platform software in a competitive environment with AT&T. And they used a crowd that had signed NDAs. So possible. Uh, and. Yeah, so the question was, if I put 100 opportunities to Top Coder, how many fail? Um, actually, for Top Coder, it's probably not a great idea. Yeah, Top Coder, actually, almost zero, because they actually break it into lots of little contests. And if, it, if a contest fails, they simply redo it. Um, and, and they actually have in-between freelancers working to glue things together. It's a really neat operation. But out of 100 just prize challenges, how many fail? Um, uh, well, our, our failure rate is about 6%. Uh, and I say fail, that failure rate is um, our, our people telling us that they did not get a, something that was really of any value. Um, we had an early failure of, we tried to have a washing machine in space, and that one failed. Well, one of the reasons is it was too complex. It's a multi-discipline problem with plumbing systems, electronic systems, all sorts of things. And what you find really quickly in the open innovation world is simplify. Get a, as simple as you can, you know, sensing strain in Kevlar, something like that. Um, now, in the future, platforms are going to be able to do much, much more, where they start to actually put together teams in rapid succession, and those teams are going to be able to, to do things that we've never even thought of. I think I went over on my two, and I'm getting the hook. So... Thank you all. This was great. I appreciate you staying late, and uh, thanks so much.